JB Knowledge Podcast Network. On episode 59 of the InsureTech Geek Podcast, talking about selling insurance where they don't sell it today with Ari Katz from Bolt. The InsureTech Geek Podcast, powered by JB Knowledge, is all about technology that's transforming and disrupting the insurance world. We're doing interviews and deep dives into specific tech we see changing the industry, taking you on a journey through insurance tech. So enjoy the ride and geek out. Man, oh man, oh man. It's been a day. It's been a week. It's been a year. It is currently Friday, June 4th, the first Friday of June. Summer is upon us, although I guess technically it's not here until, what, the 20, 21st? Is that when summer officially starts? But uh, it's hot in her. <laughs> it is hot in her. It is hot and humid in South Texas, and uh, I'm actually in South Florida right now, Rob, so it's even hotter. Uh, I, I just wrapped up my very first in-person conference uh, since COVID started, we had the uh, AGC Risk Management Conference. So it was a construction risk conference. All the brokers and carriers and everybody on the uh, that, that works in construction risk got together with all the risk managers in construction, and we geeked out on uh, insure tech and uh, construct tech for two days down in Bonita Springs, Florida, hot and humid and rainy. Uh, but it was good to see everybody. Rob, it was kind of like letting a bunch of teenagers out of school for the first time. You know what I mean? Like. Everybody's like, people, <laughs> you're in three dimensions. And then like, we all hung out and no masks anywhere. Everybody's having a good time. Everybody's vaccinated. So uh, it was pretty sweet. That's all I got to say. It's amazing. Yeah, I saw your time lapse video of your <laughs> flight and landing and kind of your trip down to uh, Florida. So um, yeah, awesome to hear. Awesome to hear. Sounds like a good Yeah, time. it was cool. It was cool. I know, uh, Ari, you guys were a couple months ahead of us on opening wide open again. Uh, I want to say you were about six or eight weeks. Uh, Texas reopened everything uh, about two and a half months ago. I want to say Israel was about four months ago. Ari Katz over in the suburbs of uh, Tel Aviv, Israel, yet another Israeli insure tech innovator. Uh, we've, had, we've had a lot of them on the show. Uh, so many that I think it's time to have like a face-to-face and sure tech event over there for all of our uh, all of our interviewees. Ari, how's it going over in the in the burbs of uh, Tel Aviv? Uh, it's going great, as you said. I think um, COVID is uh, you can say almost uh, history here in Israel. Uh, there's almost no new cases. Everything is is open. The only restrictions is uh, travel, right? When people come, and so that's the the only area that's left. Yeah, exactly. We just got to get everybody else vaccinated. That's the big thing now. But uh, yeah. yeah, it's at uh, least uh, at least we're able to to some parts of the world are able to resume all the normal economic activity. It's always good to see. Uh, Ari is the president of Bolt. We're going to talk all about what they do now and what they're going to do next. Um, and of course, we you know we love talking about what they're going to do next. Before we jump into our interview, just want to remind everybody that if you're watching this on streaming video or you're watching on like Twitter, or Facebook, or LinkedIn, you see our beautiful faces and all this wonderful thing. If you're doing that right now, you can subscribe to the podcast by texting geek out G E E K O U T geek out to six, six, eight, six, six. Never miss an episode. We send you an email and we don't spam you. We just send you an email every time there's a show with like the show notes and the links to the articles and that kind of stuff. So go check it out. Text geek out to six, six, eight, six, six. Now back to Ari, uh, Ari Katz is president of bolt. Um, and, and we're gonna uh, we're gonna kind of walk through Ari. We, we we love talking about technology, and we love talking about insure tech. But I love talking about the people behind it before we jump into the product. And so you're gonna have to go through the unfortunately uncomfortable exercise of talking about yourself. And uh, I, I just want to kind of run through your your background. You know, you you had uh, you you had some some. Uh, it's some interesting stuff. So you went to the Isra- Israel Institute of Technology, uh, 89 to 93. I, I'm just curious from, from there to what is f- a fairly limited uh, employment history on LinkedIn, might I add, <laughs> when I looked at you, yeah. uh, which means Israeli security forces, Mossad. I don't know what it means. Uh, tell me when you were growing up as a small boy in Israel, what did you envision doing? And then what did you end up doing? So I think growing up, uh, I always wanted to to change uh, to change the world. 
So uh, ended up uh, changing stuff in insurance, not the world, but uh, at least something is changing. Um, so you talk about background. So um, I was uh, I did study in, in, in Technion, and then I went to the uh, Israeli intelligence. So that was studying before the army and then intelligence and then uh, founded company. So uh, Bolt is actually the third company. Nice. That, uh, that we found. What were the other two? So the first one was fleet management and, uh, and then moving into uh, insurance solutions for, uh, for agents. The second one was uh, optimizing resources uh, that was actually sold to uh, NBC. And uh, Bolt is the third company that uh, we've established. Then are you, uh, are, what is your background? Because <clears throat> uh, obviously you had, you had some military service and you had your te- <clears throat> technological uh, education and upbringing. Is, is your background in technology and then you learned insurance through the eyes of technology? Yes, the background is uh, definitely tech, uh, software and, and technology. That's, that's the background. And uh, insurance is, uh, has been learned for the past uh, 20 years. They've been uh, back and forth between uh, Israel and, uh, and the United States. Not in the last year, but uh, for the last 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I had the, the same thing, right? I mean, I, I started writing software in 91. I was about uh, 12 and uh, then you know, 11, 12, somewhere around there. And then uh, I've been like heads down in tech. And then I, I started in insurance about 15 years ago. Oh, no, more than that. Lord, it's 2021. 17 years ago and uh and kind of learned insurance by writing code for insurance right so i i learned it from the software developers perspective it sounded like you did it as well yeah yeah it's very similar yeah, yeah. random random <laughs> question uh what was your first programming language you learned first programming language ah that's yeah school like pascal <laughs> pascal yes okay so mine was <laughs> mine was GW Basic, and then I moved into Pascal, and I wrote a ton of yeah. programs in Pascal. What a what a yeah. wonderful programming language! And I did you know Fortran, Assembly, C, that kind of stuff. Uh, when was the last? All right, second question. When was the last time that you wrote code? Wow, uh, maybe fifteen years ago. Yeah, same, same, about the same for me. <laughs> I actually cracked open. I installed Visual Studio the other day. <clears throat> downloaded a, some development kits and and wrote some JavaScript code just to just to do it, just to like have a compiler and, and write some code. But I, I haven't really touched production code in about 15 years myself as well. Uh, but certainly it, it colors your background a whole lot. So let's jump to Bolt. Uh, how long has Bolt been in business? So the, the current offering of what we do is about six, seven years old. Nice. Changed beforehand. Yeah. Yeah. And you got, you, you got acquired. Uh, that company is called Bolt Holdings now, um, and that's that's what like fourteen hundred employees I think you said earlier. And Bolt yeah, itself Bolt is, is yeah, yeah, and then Bolt itself is about three hundred and fifty employees. Tell everybody exactly what Bolt does. Like you know, sixty seconds or less. What's the elevator pitch on what Bolt does for insurance? So we are we are the insurance exchange. We connect uh, buyers and sellers of insurance. We allow different parties to connect to the exchange and leverage the exchange to, to buy and sell insurance. Awesome. And you make your money on both sides of the transaction. So the people who are buying and the people who are selling. Yeah, we make money on both sides of the, from both sides of the exchange. Um, if you talk about the ones that are actually leveraging uh, our platform in order to, um, to sell insurance, those are the, the carriers that provide their product on the exchange. We have over a hundred carriers and over 5,000 connections, basically carrier line of business state combination that we support on the exchange, all connected in real time, uh, that you can, you can actually uh, connect and, and, uh, and leverage. On the other, other hand, you have the, the buyers of the insurance that can be um, different types of entities. Uh, it can be um, insurance companies that want to add more products to their portfolio and basically uh, keep the customer, regardless if they have a product or not. Uh, it can be a, an insurance broker uh, medium to large brokers that license the technology uh, for, for, for their own purposes. Or it can be a partnerships where we allow people that don't sell insurance to connect and basically convert their traffic into policies. Gotcha. Gotcha. So um, what, what would you say the big innovative thing that y'all have done? Because obviously at, at this size of company, you've done something right. You know, you pivoted six or seven years ago into the in the current iteration of Bolt. What have you done really well that led to the level of success you've had with uh, with getting people to participate in your exchange versus others? What what made Bolt unique, special, different, better? So I think that we've we've the technology we've built allow us to connect uh, 
multiple different systems, uh, multiple different products in, into one environment. So we support all the different commercial lines, all the different personal lines, uh, all that through a rule-based environment. So the actual process itself is being created dynamically based on the actual risks. So if you take, a, I don't know, an auto policy in, in, in a specific state, uh, we would go and based on the actual rules for the dif different carriers that will, will participate for this line of business and for this uh, state uh, and generate a dynamic interview que questionnaire process based on the data that those specific carriers need. As you answer questions, uh, based on the answers, we know now that instead of 10 carriers, only three carriers are relevant that will actually write the risk and we'll only ask questions for those three carriers. So all the process itself is dynamic, all the, uh, um, based on the rules and all the logic that we've incorporated. And it's, it, uh, the number of rules is, is, is huge, right? Think of the, all the different combinations of carriers, lines of business and states that are in the platform. That's the thing where the leveraging the, what we've built and what we put onto it uh, is, I think, the, the main asset here that connects the, the industry. Awesome. Rob? Yeah, all right. It's a pleasure to, to have you on the podcast. Could you maybe give a little bit more on the, the scope of the type of products? So you mentioned the over 5,000 product variations. I know you've written over 4 million policies in 2020, um, have an annualized premium of 4.6 billion. So to James's point, you guys uh, have definitely you know, been around and, and experienced some tremendous growth. Um, I'm just curious, you know, are these hard to place markets? Uh, is this not admitted business admitted? You mentioned kind of personal and commercial lines. Uh, is it focused on small commercial? Maybe you can give a sense for where you see the most uh, traction. So I would say it's almost all of the above. So it's more, it's uh, both the ones that are, that are easy to place, but also the ones that are harder to place. Again, it depends on the, on the actual traffic. So I'll give you an example. If you look at uh, progressive, if you go to progressive if, uh, homeowners, that, that's our platform. So, uh, the, the type of traffic there is all the different homeowners, right? It's not uh, hard to place. It's also the easy to place. So that's one, one type of uh, customer. The other, other type is, uh, let's say, farmers. So we power Craft Lake where uh, it, with farmers, if the stuff that farmer doesn't want to write will go to their uh, in-house agency and then it will go to the different markets. So areas where they don't want to write. It can be hard to place areas, coastal areas, et cetera, but it can be also... Uh, types of businesses that they, they don't want to write. Or it can be uh, a zip codes that, uh, in Liberty, zip codes that they have overexposure. So it's great risks, but now they have overexposure, so they want to move it to someone else. So it's all of the above, and it, 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 there's no mid and large commercial. It's only small commercial uh, and all the personal line stuff. Yeah, that's uh, super, super helpful. So maybe you can just dig a little bit more. You talked about some of the, the groups that you work with, the carriers. I think that kind of use cases is, is obvious, but I'm kind of curious just about, you know, uh, on your website, you talk about market innovators, right? People that have a new product, uh, entrance distributors, independent agencies. Maybe you can just give a couple of sentences on how you, how you support each group or how they, you know, what's the, the value for them? Yeah. So first of all, on the carers, when you talk about the carers, clearly I, we, we talked about a few, but it's not the same, um, I would say, business value for the different carers. Some of them will do it for uh, older, let's say, progressive homeowners. Some will say it's uh, for the stuff we don't want to write or want to change. And some will say, like a USAA, that it's um, I'm losing the non-members and uh, I'm using the platform to get non-members and, and the ones that don't fit the USAA uh, uh, membership, right? So there are different reasons and different ways that you want to leverage it as a carrier. Uh, if you talk about non-carriers, then you have uh, someone, let's say I used, uh, let's use, take an example, someone like a nerd wallet. So nerd wallet, we provide them a way to increase their revenue into a recurring revenue versus uh, a one-time sale of the lead. So before both, they would sell the lead to, to different uh, lead mechanisms that, that are available. What we allow them to do is leverage the traffic in order to sell insurance um, using our capabilities. We're also an appointed agency, so we have appointment in all the 50 states, and we have a call center operation that supports selling insurance, uh, leveraging our platform with all the different markets to support those types of uh, partnerships. So this is someone that didn't sell insurance before, they were selling the leads, and now they are selling insurance to us. That's, that's, that's one example of someone uh, leveraging it uh, and not a carrier. Other types of users are agents that subscribe to us because we are also a digital wholesaler, what's what we call the bolt access. So basically any agent that want to get access to this platform, to this exchange, all they need to do is sign up, put their credit card, and start uh, start um, the next day 
or the next hour uh, after they provide their ENO and all, all the relevant documentation to start selling insurance to us as a digital wholesaler, providing them access to markets and providing them access to platforms. So they just plug in, they get both the system and the appointments and can, can start selling. So that's another type of client uh, using this, again, using the same thing. It's the same, same connection, same platform, just different use cases of who's going to use it, whether it's a carrier, a broker, small agent, or a non-insurance entity. Does this, uh, Ari, does this liberate the market to be more competitive? Like when you, when you can bring more people selling more products in more states, does this drive more competition and kind of uh, grease the wheels of capitalism uh, to, in, in, to, to a sense that you're, you're able to, to drive up the number of people selling more products in more places? Yeah, I think it greases up. I think it, it creates a better efficiency. Uh, what, what we create, from, from, as, as we see it, is, is a flywheel effect because we have uh, the big, big insurance carriers that are selling uh, and, and bringing traffic to the platform. This actually creates the demand for different markets, different carriers that want to put their product on the platform, basically providing liquidity, providing to that distribution. That creates the transaction to become more efficient. So someone comes to the platform. Now, instead of two, one option, they have 10 options. It doesn't mean that they will see all the 10 options. That's uh, optimization that you might, we might be, in certain cases, showing just one optimized quote versus 10 quotes. But at least you go to the market and, and, and see what's available and present that. And that, feed, and that basically feeds back to more people that want to join and, and get access to this uh, efficient transaction. It also creates a, a side effect, that, like you said, that allows smaller products or other products that currently are, don't have the distribution to, uh, to join in. So it's easier to add on flood to homeowners. It's easier to add pet insurance to homeowners or, or other examples where you can add smaller products that as a standalone product, uh, don't get, really have a distribution because it's lower premium and, and it's hard to, be, to get into uh, to the people. So the actual market is growing, the actual insurance market, by making the transaction more efficient for the end consumer, whether they do it themselves or through an agent. An efficient market is easy to access, right? I mean, a, an inefficient market has high barriers to access. Yeah. So you're bringing efficiency to the entire insurance market by making it easier for people who are who are uh, trying to create new lines of business to get distribution quickly and for those that want to sell new lines of business to get access to that quickly right so it's it's kind of it's kind of both you, you know you, from what it sounds like if you're on the agent side that you know you, you provide some documentation like how quickly give me give me an example of how fast they can actually get gain access to the marketplace is it a matter of hours or days yeah, it's a matter of hours. You just need to provide um, uh, your ENO and your license. We check it with Nipper to say that uh, that you are licensed in, in the states you want to write. So we just validate that, and then you, you get access to the platform. What about the people that are producing the product? So how how much time does it take for them to get access to to get more distribution? So that that varies based on the product, based on what they have available, and um, so it can take I don't know between four to eight weeks to to, to onboard a new carrier product on on the platform. It can be a one state, it can be fifty states. So it it, it is a, a a big very big range between uh, what the different carriers have and and their products. But we see it more and more. We see more and more carriers that want to add their products uh, to the platform because they see the the value. They see that there is a lot of traffic that can come in, and they can actually pick and choose. They can say, I want to get only direct to consumer traffic. I only want to get agent traffic. I want to get from this state. I want... So it's very easy for someone that has a new product or even an existing product. Now I'm, I have a new, just base, most basic uh, auto insurance uh, product, but I want to get access to distribution. So in a typical way, you would either go on a D2C and start spending money on buying traffic for different, with different ways, or you would start recruiting agents to sell your product. Uh, with Bolt, what you do is just plug into Bolt and we can give you access from the different channels that we have immediately, almost immediately. You need to get for our appointment, but almost immediately you can have different types of distribution just by plugging into our platform. So that's a big benefit that uh, those uh, carriers or markets. I know Rob had a further question on kind of the value related to that. Rob? Yeah, James, I'm actually curious. You, you mentioned already kind of plugging into the system. So I'm going to ask the James question and, and get a bit technical here and kind of, is this something that, 
you require kind of an API connection or are you kind of building, you know, rating and underwriting tables on your side? Maybe you can just kind of give us a, a little behind the curtain for, you know, what are some of the basic requirements um, that somebody would need to meet in order to be able to put their product on on your exchange? So what we require is a, is a, is a rating API. So the care that want to join need to provide uh, uh, an API so we can get a quote from them. We don't do the, the rating ourselves. We connect to the different care, so the rate is always the rate coming from the care. It's it's always accurate because they are the one providing it. It's not us calculating it and then uh, making sure that we continue and update the tables as they update the tables. So from our perspective, that's the that's the method of connecting. And we do have the uh, the relevant automation tools that actually check on an ongoing basis that the, the solution and, and the APIs are working and uh, um, and provide the monitoring tools for our for our support and our ongoing monitoring and knock to be able to see that. The API is working and any changes that happen, then we need to uh, to accommodate, et cetera. Because think of that, the number of, of interfaces that are that are live at each, each given moment, in some of the cares, they do changes uh, and, and, and notify us. In some cases, they don't even know that they did changes right within the insurance care. And then uh, but we find it through the, the automation. But uh, those are, all of it is, is API based. Uh, but we don't require them to, to adhere to a certain API, whatever they have available. We map it into our own superset, basically, of uh, model. And then um, maybe you can talk a little bit, too, about, I don't know if you've worked with any startups, because I know that they're offering, right, MGAs and, and others that kind of have unique offerings in the marketplace. Getting distribution is one of the biggest challenges that that they have. I think a lot have, you know, maybe naively thought that going direct is the best way, and then they kind of realize the customer acquisition costs are, are pretty high, um, and a lot have been kind of making a a pivot to sell through independent agencies, but it, it seems like your platform would be uh, a perfect f- solution to any you know startup MGAs out there that are looking to gain distribution. I don't know if you're seeing that trend of folks coming to Bolt. Yeah, I think uh, we see that. We see uh, a lot of the new uh, carers that come and want to join are um, either MGAs or a new kind of startups that want to want to distribute their product, and uh, we provide them the, a great uh, a great platform for that, right? Because we do have that uh, that available. All they need to care about is uh, is having a good product. So the way the way I see it is that the, the industry will change to be, to have carriers that focus on uh, or carriers or MGAs that focus on creating the best product, meaning that uh, it's the most profitable, the most comprehensive, whatever you define as the best product. And on the other hand, you have carriers or, or other entities that are great distributors, and some of them will do the same, will do both successfully, but some of them will focus on on on, on just one of them and leverage the other side. Uh, or other products if you are a distributor or other distributors if you have a great product. So it's not necessarily that you need to be excellent in both in order to succeed. Yeah, I think that's a really uh, important way to think about it. I, I love that clarification and in, in kind of thinking about it as the product side, the distribution side, and it can be done by the same company, but it doesn't need to be. That makes a lot of sense. So. Yeah, and we see that, right? We see that it cares that are saying now uh, in these areas we are, we are not profitable and we want to exit from those either zip code or state or product but uh, since they are our client, they can do it very easily because they continue to, to leverage the same distribution they have, but just selling other carriers, other products, the other carriers are happy to sell because they get more, more, uh, more distribution. This carrier is happy because now they, they, they shed off stuff that they don't know, know how to underwrite profitably. So, and the customer is happy because they uh, is not losing the, the policy. So it, it gets another policy, but it's still insured. So, uh, and the agent, if there is an agent, the agent is happy because he still gets his commission. So everybody's happy if we make this uh, transition. Awesome. Well, let's let's talk about the future, right? Let's look forward. And before the show, when we were talking, I asked you, you know, wh- what's what what are you really excited about going forward? And and we we named, made it the topic of the show, and so I just want to I want to I want to talk about that uh, for just a second because. You said, look, what I'm, where we could really head is enable people to sell insurance where they don't sell it today, right? And so let's talk about that. Let's talk about how how do you enable the selling of insurance where it's not sold today? What what are you doing there? Where are you bolting in? Ha ah, ah, there you go, pun intended. Uh, where 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 are you bolting into that uh, <laughs> allows you to do this? And and what does that really mean? So we, we the way the way we do it is is uh, basically first of all. The type of population or type of entities are entities that uh, either don't sell insurance or sell, I don't know, life insurance or things that are uh, related but not within the PNC, 
uh, space. So uh, that's basically providing a new type of, of traffic into, into the platform, new type of distribution. We see a lot of growth in, in, in this area this year. And the idea is that we allow them several options. You can, if you have your own journey today and, and you have the data, you can use our APIs. So basically just call our APIs with the relevant data that you have and we'll provide you uh, multiple quotes uh, and ranked quotes and basically uh, some information for you to decide how you want to present them and what to present on your side. So that's one option. And of course, everything is, is managed behind the scenes and you can issue, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one option. The second option, you don't have that. Uh, we can provide you a D2C journey that's uh, customized to, to your look and feel. So um, you have an existing journey, you add another journey uh, that's, that's based on, on our UI that you can actually uh, provide to the, uh, to the consumers that are doing this. And uh, we also provide the, the, the backend process. So if you have uh, questions or you want to buy the policy, you want to talk to an agent, we provide that backend through our call center in, uh, in Connecticut. Uh, and in Texas. So basically, that's the that's the that's the vision: leveraging all the connection, in, leverage all the appointments, uh, and and get into uh, entities that do have traffic, but are not leveraging, are not monetizing monetizing it in the same way. They they might be monetizing it in different ways, like selling the leads or uh, or, or doing other stuff. But uh, we provide them the way to do it in a recurring fashion and and providing a better service to their customer. Nobody wants to be uh, move the, uh, and getting diff different phone calls from different people because they sold the, the lead to someone. So th this means that you're going to open up new revenue streams for people that really typically would toss that traffic. So if you if you have captive, we already opened. If you have yeah, captive traffic opened. on an internet site, <laughs> you're going to open up the opportunity for them to make more money by by monetizing that traffic. That's the that's the end result, right? Exactly. And based on the context, right, if you are now looking at something that's relevant for me to offer you pet insurance, just plug to our API, you would get several offers for pet insurance or renter's insurance, or if it's a homeowner's, or if it's auto, or if it's small business. So depending on, on the type of product uh, that you already have traffic for, just call our API and, and get quote, or embed, you, embed our UI if, it, if it's something that... Uh, awesome. Rob, um, makes your comments on that? In, that? in that case. You've got me excited, Ari, uh, about some of the possibilities. And obviously, I think the, the numbers back it up, which we don't always see with uh, some of the startups. So congratulations on your success to date. Uh, just one final question. Um, maybe you could talk about the promotion, right? Because I know that's a big challenge, obviously. Lots of folks bidding on you know, insurance keywords and things like that. So are you doing any of the... I guess, you know, marketing of the platform or is that up to each individual partner, whether it be an agent, a distribution partner, a carrier to, to drive the traffic to your exchange? It's, it's up to them. So we do very, very, very small promotion uh, ourselves, uh, but it's basically the different distributors. That's, 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 their, uh, that's their business, right? That's what they do. We only provide the platform, whether we provide it just as a technology, or we provide it also technology in our appointments, or technology in our processes, and but it's we are not the ones generating the traffic. Yeah, that's that's neat. Well, Ari, um, thank you for the discussion on this. I'm excited. Uh, first off, we talked to a lot of early stage startups, and it's really good to hear from a, a really well established player with su substantial market share talking about how they have disrupted the insurance market, not what they're going to do to disrupt the insurance market. You've already you've already really uh, had a massive impact on how people buy and sell, and so we appreciate that. Appreciate the um, the success that you've had, and obviously, um, congratulations uh, in arrears uh, <laughs> on your acquisition. I know that that happened in the past, but uh, certainly that's a that's a wonderful thing for uh, for the founders uh, and executives like yourself. And so, congratulations on that, and uh, we're excited to see what continues to come out of uh, out of Bolt and uh, what you're going to do for the market. Thank you. So, Rob, uh, I've got a couple of news stories. Let's uh, let's jump into mine, and we, then we'll hop over to yours. The, my first one, uh, European insurtech startup WeFox grabs $650 million on a $3 billion valuation. Uh, all, always, uh, always interesting to see fundraising announcement, but you usually don't see uh, this type of number. Um, again, it's a German startup, WeFox, um, that got their Series C funding round led by Target Global. Um, they've reached a post money valuation of three billion. They're a digital insurer focused on personal insurance products like household insurance, motor insurance, 
personal liability insurance. Uh, again, it's a uh, WeFox. So raising a absolutely enormous sum of money, you can just go to uh, WeFox uh, dot com. W E F O X WeFox dot com, and you can check that out and see how they uh, how they sell insurance. Um, this is uh, again uh, we're seeing. Uh, more and more companies focusing on streamlined uh, underwriting, streamlined claims, all digital process, direct to consumer. It meets all the criteria, and uh, the sheer size of the transaction is what uh, what drew my attention on this one, Rob. Yeah, and I can tell you, uh, this was uh, kind of blowing up my Twitter feed this week. Uh, a lot of uh, European friends, particularly in the VC community, very, very excited about it. I think there's always been a sense that uh, the European startup community on the InsurTech side, at least, has been a bit behind the the states, and it's been a little bit more challenging for some of their startups to get funding and get traction. And there are uh, several wonderful startups um, coming out of uh, Europe. And so uh, WeFox is one of the the earlier one's definitely one of the success stories. And I think there was just a lot of German pride and European pride associated with this one, not just for the company itself, but just uh, kind of what it portends for the future of the uh, European startup community on the InsurTech side. So congrats to everyone. Yeah, Lord knows the Israelis already got it going on. You got folks like Ari and like the 5 million other people we've interviewed from Israel. They they got it going on, but uh, the, the, the Europeans are, uh, you know, Kind of sandwiched between Israel and the United States, and they they gotta they gotta catch up on uh, both funding and everything else that's going on. Uh, also in the news, this is just a, a partnership news, and this is again from uh, InsureTechNews.com, by the way, just to, to give them credit for uh, for this coverage. Uh, Ford partnered with Mile Auto, uh, so it's a, again another usage based insurance product that allows the customers. Uh, to opt in to share their driving data from the onboard tech platform. And so you, you're seeing this like uh, OnStar did this with GM where you can actually share OnStar data. Well, this is Ford saying, hey, you can share your data here so you don't have to plug a OBD2 port in. You can just share the data straight off the vehicle, straight to Mile Auto. Um, Mile Auto also has a, an, an agreement with Porsche and is available in Arizona, Georgia, Illinois, Oregon, uh, none of the states that uh, Rob or I are in. And it was, it was, it was kind of disappointing. I, I, I was trying to get um, usage-based insurance in Texas or Michigan, and I couldn't, uh, I, I couldn't find one <laughs> yet. So, again, we're just trying to get uh, all, these, all these companies admitted into all the states under all their lines, uh, which, as Everyone out there knows the United States is not one country from an insurance perspective. It's 50. <laughs> and so it makes things a lot more interesting. Of course, it creates uh, it creates opportunity for companies like Ari's to, to act as a middle, middle, middle person on that whole thing. Again, what I, I'm encouraged to see manufacturers par- partnering with InsurTechs so that uh, the InsurTechs don't have to mess with the hardware. They can just gather all the data that the uh, auto manufacturers are already gathering on their car and make it a lot easier on the customer and on the insure tech and on the manufacturer. Rob, your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think uh, you know we've been talking about this for uh, a while now, and so it's good to see it kind of formalized in agreements such as this one that the the OEMs right are starting to get into this space. And and while it may not be directly insurance, we know that that's kind of where they're they're headed. They're kind of trying to figure out you know whether it's a vehicle subscription model, whether it's being able to purchase insurance through your um, you know uh, in car entertainment system, uh, etc. So. I, it just uh, you know one more agreement and definitely a fascinating space to watch over the next five years to kind of see this integration of tech insurance and the auto OEM. Ari, I forgot to ask you, do you all actually operate heavily in Israel? Or are you solely over here in the United States and North America? I don't know clients in Israel. Uh, no, in Israel, it's only in R&D center. All the clients are uh, in the U.S. and uh, the operations are mostly in the U.S., uh, both in uh, Texas, Austin, Texas, and uh, and Connecticut. Nice, nice. Glad to glad, glad to see you in the great state of Texas. And uh, it, 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 are you seeing as much usage based insurance being offered over in Israel? No, it's not catching up much. Yeah, 
So that's that's why I'm always interested in to see like wh- what markets it's really uh, taking hold in. The U.S. appears to be a, a fairly aggressive adopter on this from a consumer perspective. They're they're ready to do. I I do dr- uh, usage based insurance for my drone flying. I, I only pay by use on my drone insurance, and uh, I wanted to do uses based insurance on uh, on a recent car purchase, but I couldn't find an admitted carrier who offered it. So a little little disappointing there. I live in the wrong state for that right now. Rob, I know you have three news stories. What do you have this week? I do. So this is, uh, you know, the humble brag week. Um, I actually did an interview with Meg Green at AM Best. So uh, it has made its way into both print and TV. So the first article, uh, the headline is author finds new technology startups, quote, amazing and full of possibilities. So, um, you know, definitely encourage our listeners to to check that out. And, And special thanks to AM Best. They actually are um, talking to different book authors over the summer and kind of highlighting some summer reads. So, um, you know, just thankful that uh, they gave me an opportunity to, to share that. And then, you know, it's kind of an interesting pairing here. So probably the biggest news story of the week, of course, involved Lemonade. Seems like that's true uh, virtually every week. Um, and this particular one is from Vox, but it was all over the news. The headline is a disturbing viral Twitter thread reveals how AI powered insurance can go wrong. So, Um, basically, uh, Lemonade had posted on Twitter talking about some of their advanced capabilities, talking about the ability to actually, uh, detect claims fraud through, uh, video through nonverbal cues and things like that. Uh, people started talking about some of the bias that's inherent in AI. This is kind of, you know, got uh, a lot of people very disturbed, uh, on what they were kind of claiming. And so they actually kind of had to walk it back. They, they, uh, put out a Twitter thread kind of saying, no, we actually, you know, only use AI this way. There's a whole blog post on the Lemonade blog site. So anyway, I highly encourage if you somehow, you know, miss that story, uh, feel free to read both the, the Vox article that we're sharing here, but then, uh, you know, check out the Lemonade blog uh, response. So anyway, it's always good to get a, a controversy involving Lemonade. And then <laughs> it kind of uh, was kind of, I guess, ironic timing because I mentioned the AM Best piece. So I actually have a 15 minute interview with AM Best TV as well. And for whatever reason, out of a, a fairly wide-ranging interview, they chose this as the headline: "Author regulating how insurers use AI, use AI may stifle competition <laughs> prematurely." Oh, so oh, I was on. like, "Well, that probably wasn't great timing after all this <laughs> lemonade a kerfuffle out there that Rob Galbraith is saying, yeah, let them do whatever they want to do." But um, my basic point was there were uh, uh, regulators such as the New York Department of Financial Services and others that were talking about using AI and really being able to, quote unquote, you know, see the algorithms, understand it. You could not use black box algorithms that were not understood. And um, obviously, we all know that a lot of AI kind of revolves around that. You don't always have that explainability or that understanding. And so I'm very much focused on kind of looking at the inputs and outputs. And, and I uh, I do think AI needs to be regulated in our space, but I think it needs to be done thoughtfully and, and carefully. And, um, you know, again, you know, this kind of controversy involving Lemonade is kind of a uh, good uh, case where we can maybe you know, quickly go to the over-regulated side. So uh, anyway, uh, it does require a subscription, unfortunately, to invest to watch the video. But if you have one, feel free to check that out. And it's not just about regulating AI, <laughs> but a whole host of other topics. Just, just to clarify, Rob Galbraith doesn't think that it's just about regulating AI. <laughs> yeah, you know, you never... Lemonade did not cite me in their blog post as the <laughs> yeah reason they can get away with it now. So, but maybe they will. Next you know, week. this is a, I mean, we just to, to wrap the show up, this is just something interesting for everybody to think about. Machine learning, the, the very essence of it is teaching a machine how to learn, right? You're, you're teaching it, but to teach it, you have to feed it inputs, and those inputs have the inherent bias of the creator. So, whenever you have a, um, whenever you have any any type of created object, the creator influences it. I mean, we could get really spiritual here right now. We're not going to, but just just think about it that way, right? There's always creator bias that is woven into the created, even when you're you're teaching a you're teaching a machine to make conclusions on its own and to look for correlation and causality there's still the influence of the creator and so you, you got to really think about that and um, what the implications will be and then you got to test the results to see if the if the if the data uh, it has has a problem right and so uh, black boxes are are very problematic for a regulated uh, environment and uh, and so 
at the end of the day, they're going to have to document exactly how their system makes decisions, even if it arrives on how it makes decisions on its own. So, uh, Rob, thank you as always. Ari Katz joining us from Israel. Ari, thank you so much for being on the show with us today. Thank you. Happy to be here. And uh, Rob, Rob, always good to see you, buddy. Likewise, James. Always good to catch up on uh, wherever you are in the U.S. <laughs> or the world. Yeah, Florida, <laughs> Florida, right now. Back in Texas this evening, and uh, yeah, if you want to, if you want to see a fun time lapse of my approach and landing into uh, in, in, into uh, the Fort Myers airspace, uh, it's on LinkedIn. I I like to time lapse. I'm I'm a pilot, and I like to fly myself around, and I time lapse all my I, uh, not not all of them, but most of my landings. They're they're fascinating to look at, look at in a time lapse. So go check it out. But had a great time. Looking forward to my next set of conferences. Uh, I've got a whole bunch coming up. I, I don't know about you, Rob. I've started getting booked at a bunch of stuff starting in August and later. And uh, so conference season is back. Woo! Get to see people. It's going to be great. Uh, so looking looking forward to that. And of course, I'm going to be at uh, uh, Insure Tech Connect. I can't wait to uh, be there. I'll be uh, exhibiting our products, uh, Smart Compliance and TerraClaim. I'm going to be talking about. Uh, our two products for COI tracking and insurance claims management, and would be happy to, to see all of you over there in Vegas. It'll be fun. Uh, but, uh, but with that, it is time to, to wrap our lovely show. This has been the Insure Tech Geek Podcast powered by JB Knowledge, jbknowledge.com. It's all about technology that's transforming and disrupting the insurance world. I've been your host, James Benham, jamesbenham.com, with co-host Rob Galbraith, endofinsurance.com. Big thanks to Jim Greenley, our podcast producer, Kara Dalton, our creative producer, and thank you for joining us today. We're taking you on a journey through insurance tech. So enjoy the ride and geek out. See you next time.